What gets you out of bed in the morning? Your kids? A cause? Fresh air? Your boss? What if I told you there's a way to get all those things without getting out of bed in the morning? We have solved world hunger, made a space where it never thunders. Just close your eyes, exercise, all in, wait for it, the metaverse. A virtual space where you can see more than people's face. Visit their place, the future of the human race. The good kind of climate change, virtual commodity exchange. For once, we'll know exactly who to blame for this twisty, sickly game. We already know his name due to our culture of fame. Mark Elliott Zuckerberg. Thank you for my poetry debut. Wow, well done. Thank you. I thought, as you know, I've been writing my stand-up routine. Right, yeah. So I thought there'd be a bit about the metaverse anyway, so I'd make a little comedic poem about the metaverse, since that's one of the things we're talking about today. And yeah. trying to make it satirical, but also a little serious, saying it's a bit of a horrible concept. It sounds like a good bit for your routine. Thank you. It really does. Um, so yeah, today we're talking about the metaverse, and also we're going to outline our own solar scene degrowth goals, kind of a spin-off of the sustainable development goals by our sister organization, the UN. Yes. They're not really our sister organization, but someday, maybe. That'd be funny. It's is... just secretly we've been sponsored by the UN. This is kind of our way of ending the semester on degrowth, because both these exercises are... They, they kind of encapsulate the pros and the cons or like the negatives mm. and the, the positives of the whole conversation. So if we don't come up with any other questions during the episode, next week will be a conclusion, a summary, mm. a goodbye. A goodbye for now, because the next week we will, in fact, have an episode and every week following. Yeah. What I liked about your poem was you didn't beat around the bush. No. Three names. Mm -hmm. Mark, Elliot. And Zuckerberg, mm -hmm. all three, because, you know, most people don't know the middle one, but that's important. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good one to go off point because a lot of the criticism of the metaverse that I found borderlines just character critique of Zuckerberg. Mm -hmm. I kind of go along with it. I mean, of course, our biggest um, visceral reaction to watching the, the metaverse unveiling keynote keynote. Yeah, was, wow, that guy doesn't look human. It's true. Um, we know he's creepy, though, mm -hmm. and we know he's, I think he's just a villain. He obviously has some kind of God complex, but I also think it's important to separate him from the whole concept, just because they might have and still might choose someone more personable or charismatic to present these kind of concepts or these kind of products, which is what they are, mm -hmm. to the populace. Yeah. And if they choose like, oh, look, it's The Rock. Mm-hmm. People were like, oh, that sounds kind of cool. Yeah. But since it's Zuckerberg, people were like, oh, that's, that looks gross. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But it's not just the person presenting it. It's, in a way, we're lucky that the way they introduced it was with probably one of the most unlikable people on the planet. Yes. But next time, they might be more smart. Yes. It might be Jennifer Aniston. <laughs> Who knows? Right. So the metaverse, what is it? Um, from its Wikipedia, this is a network of 3D virtual worlds focused on social connection, often described as a hypothetical iteration of the internet as a single universal virtual world that is facilitated by the use of VR and AR headsets, that's virtual reality and augmented reality, and even haptic feedback technologies. Mm -hmm. So suits that make you really feel like you're feeling stuff. Mm -hmm. I'll add that everything in it will be branded. Mm -hmm. Everything in it will be brought to you by Verizon or mm -hmm. whatever company, Meta, in the, in the main instance. So we kind of wanted to spend this episode to really critique the idea of the metaverse as clinically as possible. So not trying to just dismiss it like mm -hmm. we kind of did last week. Yes. Even if I do think it is worthy of dismissal. Mm -hmm. So where did you start on that endeavor? Well, I started by finding the ways that it was the antithesis of degrowth. Oh, yeah. and of sustainable development and all the ideas that we like and like to talk about. And I got to the core of it, and then I thought we could kind of work backwards from there. Sure. To me, the metaverse is anti-democracy. Okay. Because as it was the case with the internet and still is the case, it says it's the democratization of knowledge and of 
access to all these things that otherwise you wouldn't be able to access. So right. in the metaverse, you can go to Hawaii. You can go visit Plato, as you said, in the ancient schools of thought. You can just like go anywhere, anytime, any place, be anyone you want. So why isn't that democratic? Whereas right now, we can't go wherever we want. We can't see whoever we want in concert and so on because of different concerns. But to me, it's like, okay, you can access all those things, but the reason it's anti-democracy is because it's like a pyramid scheme. Okay. So, okay, at the bottom, yes, we're all buying into it. It may cost you 15 cents to attend concerts now and 25 cents to buy a cool new outfit for your avatar. Right. But every time you do that, it's like the illusion of choice when in reality you're being forced to buy from these companies that are selling it to you. And also, if you are, in fact, someone who makes real life clothes or who does tours or who teaches at a real university, you're not going to have the choice anymore to do that. You will be forced into the metaverse if you want to remain competitive and therefore remain alive because we do need to make money somehow. Right. Okay. On that point, we sound like we're, we're both very optimistic about the odds of the metaverse catching on. Yes. So we should kind of preface it with our thoughts on its popularity in the future. Yes. So you just said that a lot of professors and real life professions mm -hmm. won't have the option to not live in the metaverse essentially yes. or work there. The reason this is so terrifying is just because it will be very popular. Mm -hmm. I mean, all the online reaction that I've seen to this and all the kind of well thought out reactions to it have been overwhelmingly negative, mm -hmm. which I like to see. Yes. But the issue with that is that it's grown-ups writing those reviews, mm -hmm. writing those responses. And I honestly don't think the metaverse is exactly targeting grown-ups. I think it's targeting I children. Agree. I had this stat that um, in April of 2020, 27 million users of Fortnite attended the virtual Travis Scott concert. Okay. And I was like, those are just all kids. Mm -hmm. So it's this issue where we, and this is why I, I count ourselves lucky that we're kind of like the last generation that is on the right side of this. Mm -hmm. We um, understand the merits of the real world and have something of a visceral disgust for most things virtual. Mm -hmm. Pretty much everyone younger than us doesn't. Pretty yeah. much everyone younger than the age of like 10 definitely doesn't mm -hmm. because it's just second nature to them. Fortnite, mm -hmm. Roblox, they've pretty much grown up with a screen in their hand. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, yeah, it's very scary, especially the very young ones have grown up with a screen in their hand and also maybe still haven't even gone to school because of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. I mean, the last 18 months might not seem like that long a time in our life, but for a three-year-old, that's like half their life. Yeah. And then the first 18 months, they were barely even aware of stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's fundamentally shaped like half a generation. Yeah, for sure. And the kids who perhaps were five going into the pandemic and are now seven and haven't gone to school, Yeah. it's like they're going to have a lot to deal with and being proposed the metaverse because that's about 10 years in the future that it will be fully realized is like the expectation. Okay. So in 10 years when these seven-year-olds are then 17-year-olds and they're proposed with the idea of you can go anywhere, be anyone you want to be, all from the safety and the comfort of your own home will feel this is excellent. I don't have to risk spreading a new disease. I don't have to risk the financial investment of going to school or traveling or whatever. I can just do it all from home. Yeah. Perfect. It's a, it's a long game. Definitely. Yeah. It's a, it's very disgusting. And what we're saying about the popularity and why even people who don't like it might be forced to, to play the game is, well, I'd say it's similar to the internet. Like imagine trying to start a business today without mm -hmm. engaging on the internet. Yeah. Very difficult. Yeah. Borderline impossible, depending yes. on where you live. Yeah. You mentioned the adoption curve, which we all learned. And it's like there's the early adopters who they're going out on a whim. They're going to adopt it. They're going to adopt the metaverse. These will be the kids. These will be the like the hipsters who are like really into the new things or whatever. Yeah. But then once they start adopting it, you said it's only 35% of people have to adopt it for everyone else to basically be forced to follow Well, something suit. like that. And the, one of the things that bothers me the most about this is that none of it is, use the word democratic, I don't know if that's exactly right, but none of it is ground up support. Like, mm -hmm. oh, the people are really saying we want to be in this. Mm -hmm. It's entirely top down corporations who no mm -hmm. one voted for yep. are basically, I think, conspiring amongst themselves 
to try and popularize it mm -hmm. because they realize like i saw that, like there's a, there's a lot of fashion companies like luxury fashion companies who are just pumping out nfts now yes and it's like no one wants nfts well it's <laughs> obviously people do but it's like who does i think a lot of kids do mm -hmm. i think a lot of these like cringe tech people do and i also think there's a lot of people who are just completely disregarding the impact of something like this mm. in the name of oh well it might be easy to make money which it yes. is easy to make money it, like it is just a, a simple opportunity for instance with trading nfts which basically have no function to society other than making the individual money yes but we have gotten into this headspace where it's just normal to be like oh what's the easiest way to make money yeah because it's not that easy it's like you can work literally 40 to 60 hours a week and barely have enough money to pay the bills. Hmm. So we're looking for ways to reduce that number, even if it doesn't benefit society at large. Yeah, and even if it's actively detrimental to the future of the human species. I was trying to understand NFTs. Like, I mean, I understand them, but I was trying to understand what people see in them. Mm -hmm. And one uh, scary defense of them I saw was, Think of it like Pokemon cards. That's why they're so popular. Mm -hmm. And I was like, but when did it become okay for adults en masse to be really into Pokemon cards? Mm -hmm. I know this sounds so judgmental, but this is going to be like a hot take. I think that judgment and shaming need to come back. <laughs> in our culture, I, I really think that because I was thinking about like nerd culture in general and typically those would be the people who would be using Pokemon cards into their adulthood, right? Mm -hmm. Or like collecting. Yes. And that's gone mainstream now. I mean, with like Big Bang Theory, maybe that was like 10 years ago. Nerd mm -hmm. culture is like, oh, everyone's a nerd now. Yeah. But I was like, nerds used to be a minority of people who kind of lacked friends and adventure and mm -hmm. any kind of power. I'm not saying that in like a mean way, but like a social standing mm -hmm. or financial, I don't know. And so they would kind of live through the Avengers, and that would be the heroism that they got to witness. Okay. You know, like, oh, yes, well, I see what you mean. my life is boring and I'm not doing very much, but I'm really excited to see what Thor's doing this week. Mm -hmm. And it's like, now everyone's like this. Yes, I see what you mean. And I don't think it's our fault No. in the main, but I think that needs to be recognized, that it's not just a casual or superficial thing that this type of culture is now really mainstream among adults mm -hmm. it's actually kind of a, a bad thing and it kind of signifies this deep lack of genuine meaning mm. like i was thinking about the avengers the, yes. uh, the movies the mcu and that's basically like culture said what if we took one of these blockbuster movies which have been around for 50 years since the 70s mm -hmm. and we just said what if it lasted forever mm -hmm. like what if it didn't just last two hours what if it lasted 200 yes that's essentially what the avengers movies are it's like, that's not a good thing, though. Mm. I totally see what you mean. I'm thinking of, like, perhaps we're all hobbits. Okay. We don't like the adventure, or we just kind of avoid it, or we don't have it in our lives. It's that's, like there's no adventure coming. Yes. But instead of just being content with it and building our community and having our tea and doing the things that hobbits do, mm. we watch Lord of the Rings instead of actually going on the adventure if we want the adventure. That's exactly what it is. But it's not that we're content with not having adventure, nor that we should be. Mm -hmm. Like I mean, humans need that to feel fulfilled, to feel excited, and to basically not live in a nihilistic existence. Mm -hmm. I think it's the fact that, I mean, this is kind of like a Nietzschean idea, but we, most people aren't religious anymore. Mm -hmm. Most people don't have any sense of patriotism or like mm -hmm. military engagement or even civil engagement. Most people are very disenfranchised with politics, for instance. Most of the world is explored mm -hmm. and most people don't have a job that fulfills them. Mm -hmm. So it's like any kind of adventure pretty much comes from the weekend, mm -hmm. having fun or um, like you said, yeah, Lord of the Rings, mm -hmm. which is not great. I mean, the, this kind of sounds like a tangent, but I think it's an obvious parallel with the metaverse mm -hmm. in that it appeals to all our worst impulses that have been mm -hmm. conditioned over the last, say, 20 years, whenever consumer internet really like mm -hmm. broke big. For us, that's most of our life. Yes. But yeah, it, it appeals to all of our worst hedonism, consumerism, and just the, the deification of pleasure and mm -hmm. materials that dominates popular culture today. Mm -hmm. I'm going to kind of combat all these things with my SDGs that I made. Okay. 
But I did go through and find, like, out of the the video that we watched, the keynote, there were basically five or six key points that were made. Right. Arguing for the metaverse, obviously. Mm. So I went through them one by one at your recommendation. And what would you say refuted them? Sure. So the first one was immersive learning. We both like learning. We both think learning should be a more common and lifelong practice. Yeah. However, I suspect if this was going on in the metaverse, it would kill imagination and creativity. <laughs> do you agree with that? Uh, yeah, I do. Yes, because the fun of learning or reading a book about ancient civilizations is imagining it and using that part of your brain. Hmm. And I'm even pro picture book. Okay. Believe it or not, I like pictures. Mm. I would argue that a video here and there would be useful to watch a documentary about these civilizations, some renderings of them and what have you. But if you were just presented with, you can go to space, you can go to these, you can go to visit the pyramids when they were built. You're like you're, There's no room for the imagination because you're literally just presented, here it is. You don't need to connect any dots. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of merit to a creative and imaginative society of course another thing with immersive learning is that i feel like it would discourage cooperative learning because you're not going to need to rely on your peers to kind of bounce off each other and oh here's my experience here's mine when again you're just presented with all of the experiences and i think okay perhaps the individual would be they would know more However, I'd also argue that isn't the case because of the amount of stuff we read on the internet and just don't absorb. Well, we've externalized our brains, right? Yeah. But even if we were absorbing more, you're losing peership. Like, you're losing Yeah, I would say it's mostly lost. When we're arguing against the metaverse, I know you said it's 10 years away for it to be fully realized, but it's like, we're essentially already in it, just, just lacking the VR, yes. just lacking the AR. So people might say, well, why aren't you against already the state of internet and what it does to us? and our mm -hmm. relationships with technology. And I'm like, we are. Yeah. We've spent like 13 episodes talking about it, but we were reminiscing the other day about our experience in university, and we were like, probably the scariest part of our college courses was every single time a professor would open things up for discussion. Mm -hmm. Like every single time. Yes. Over four years. And the room would be dead. Mm -hmm. And in the older professors, we said you could see they were kind of surprised or expecting people to talk and they were like where's the discussion mm -hmm. but the younger ones the ones who had grown up with the internet and were more like us mm -hmm. just kind of felt the same yeah it's like they pretty much only asked for discussion as a formality i don't mm -hmm. think anyone was really expecting some kind of heated debate which is what universities are for mm -hmm. but yeah socially the idea of social learning that isn't on twitter social learning in real life collaborative exchange of ideas mm -hmm. that is in a rough state. Mm -hmm. And we were saying we took some courses at like a subset of our university, which was a lot more, I feel like it was just all the hipsters in one place. Yes. Who were perhaps not on the internet, not so disenfranchised with their own thoughts. They're not on Twitter reading and thinking, well, my thoughts are dumb compared to these. So they would actually speak up. And that's where I learned the most and retained the most information because I was forced to engage in conversation. Right. Because when you mess up, I feel like this is like an age old thing that people say, but it's like when you answer the question wrong, you're never going to forget the answer because mm. you were like embarrassed, which sucks to be embarrassed, but like you learn. You remember it more, right? Yeah. One thing I always, I always say about myself and I think other people share this experience is that it's so, so rare that you make any kind of memory mm -hmm. when you are looking at a screen. Yeah. And yet we look at screens. I have the stat. It's like the average American spends about seven hours a day online. Yeah, that's nuts. And I think that's a couple of years outdated. It might be mm -hmm. more. But it's like, it's very rare that I would have a memory. Mm. With the exception of perhaps like watching a soccer game or something? No. No? Sport, no. You don't have any sports memories? No, I'm, not many? I, I don't, yeah, not many for the, say, hundreds of hours that I've watched Fair enough. sports. Yeah. Films is a little bit different because I consider those art. But I wanted to talk about the immersion that you just mentioned when it comes to learning. Because... One experience I had in university that I really liked actually was um, I had a class in medieval theater and ancient and medieval theater. And there was a professor who used an Assassin's Creed demonstration on the screen mm -hmm. to show us a pretty faithful um, reconstructed ancient Greece, mm -hmm. Athens. 
and he was like walking around and he was like oh this is the theater of athena mm -hmm. and all this kind of stuff and i like those so when i agree with you that the metaverse and immersive learning is not a good idea mm -hmm. i think the actual technologies that go into it mm -hmm. i don't think there's anything inherently wrong with vr or ar I, i'm actually yeah. kind of pro both those things in used in the right ways yeah in the computer lab in the computer lab because yeah. i think that yeah if i was offered the vr chance to go and visit ancient greece i'd be like mm -hmm. yeah yeah but i wouldn't want to do it permanently mm -hmm. <laughs> what i don't like about the metaverse is its its main quote-unquote selling point which is its interconnectedness and the fact that all these different things are seamlessly put together so mm -hmm. that you never have to leave yes it's like i don't i don't like that but if it was just a computer program which mm -hmm. most vr programs today are i think that would be a, a cool thing when used in moderation mm -hmm. one thing i like about um we sports mm -hmm. every hour or half an hour there'd be that little message thing go outside yeah that's very very rare that a tech company would put that into their software mm -hmm. for obvious reasons yes i think yeah i was going to get to that with the learning it's just like that's the one space where i feel like it could be useful mm. but i didn't even want to mention any pros because also no, I wanted to mention some pros because I, <laughs> I wanted to take it seriously, but those were, I, I really thought about it and those were the only pros that I could come mm -hmm. up with. Like VR and AR both have a lot of pros. We were talking about like surgery yeah. or flight training. Mm -hmm. but there's a lot of pros for education like that. But when, when it all comes together, mm -hmm. that's, when it's, that's when it's rocky. Yeah. Something else I want to talk about is um, long distance relationships. Mm. Because one of my points I had against the metaverse was that it's absent of any responsibility, difficulty, boredom, and therefore meaning. Mm. Because meaning is only really present when you have some time to think and when yeah. there are some things wrong. I know this is like subjective, but my opinion of the meaning of life is something like meaningful work or enacting positive change. Mm -hmm. You know, thinking that you've changed things for the better mm -hmm. when you're dead. Yes. And I was thinking about when you and I had a long distance relationship for like a year and a half or something like that yeah but then it was on and off long distance relationship because sometimes we'd be together for school mm -hmm. and i was like we lived a lot in our text message chat mm -hmm. did a lot of facetimes yeah sent letters mm -hmm. things like that and i was thinking like 200 years ago we'd just be sending letters mm -hmm. and 200 years from now we'd be in the metaverse with haptic feedback suits on and it would not feel that much different mm -hmm. if any different yeah and I was like, but that strengthened me individually, mm -hmm. us together. Yeah. It was a net good thing, probably, even yes. if in the moment we were obviously would have chosen the metaverse relationship. Relationship, yeah. Yeah. It would be called metaverse relationships. Okay. That app or that room. <laughs> but yeah, because we learned how to deal with conflict, mm. but in kind of a distant way. Because had we had our first like disagreement in person, I imagine it would have been a lot more like intense not the specifics of relationships but it just it was a miserable period for the most yes. part like it made you miserable yes for a long time and i think that's good for a human perhaps so when you talk about like democratic when it comes to things like our products that we use i look at grocery stores and like pop is really a good seller and so is chocolate mm -hmm. and like candy it's like but these things aren't good for us yeah but we just have a kind of hedonistic pleasure-seeking impulse mm -hmm. So my thought is that democracy looks best when the people are really educated about what's good for them. Mm -hmm. But this is designed to target, to one, target those of us who can't even make decisions properly, mm -hmm. for the rest of us to appeal to the worst parts of our brain, mm -hmm. which a lot of which has been conditioned by the internet, including Facebook. Like something mm -hmm. I find funny, there's this quote by Zuckerberg, maybe in the keynote, he said, when developing this, the dream was to feel present with the people we care about. Mm -hmm. It's like, but that's how things were before Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> You're just trying to solve problems that you helped cause. Yeah, one of the pros that I saw listed was improved security. And I was like, sir, you created the issues. You leaked our information. Yeah. You gathered our information. How, you're just, yeah, posing a problem that yeah. you created. The security is also plugging out of the world and, you know, sitting in a room with a headset on, not yeah. being able to hear or see anything around you for hours on end. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We were remarking that in the keynote, it's funny they were not really showing 
the dude in his basement on the couch with the headset yeah. on. They were pre preferring to show these these wondrous dream worlds, which, by mm -hmm. the way, looked really bad. Like the graphics they looked did look awful, really bad, and that's yeah. another thing that makes me think they're appealing to kids mm -hmm. because mobile games and Fortnite mm -hmm. are hideous mm -hmm. graphically, and uh, this is, I would say, a deliberate choice to try and evoke those mm -hmm. those styles. I agree. Even the language they used was certainly not trying to appeal to us. Mm. They were like radical. Like they were using like really outdated slang, but also like perhaps some new slang that I didn't even know that yeah. kids know from Fortnite. And I was like, <laughs> this is lame. I don't know. Maybe Zuckerberg is just on the cutting edge of language. Maybe I don't know, he of, is. Of slang. Another yeah. thing is, well, you can keep going with your refutations, actually. I'll just go through them quickly now. Improved productivity. I said, one, we're too obsessed with productivity anyway. Mm. I don't think we should stop improving efficiency of the things we use because I think it'd be great if we only had to work like a little bit less or we could use less energy, even if it's green energy. I think efficiency is great, but productivity is like life so much more than that. Yeah, this is this is why I think boredom is a good thing. And a lot of mm -hmm. scientists, when I was looking it up, I thought it was just kind of a weird instinct that I had. It's mm -hmm. like, oh, boredom is good for people. But it's like a lot of scientists and psychologists say that Boredom is actually really good for creative thinking mm -hmm. as well as your social life. Yeah. So that is essentially travel. It's like yeah. you're 20 minutes in your commute or mm -hmm. walking somewhere. People are like, oh, I wish I didn't have to do this. It's like, but it's good for you. And it's not good to just be bang, 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 bang mm -hmm. phenomena. Yes. And, <laughs> okay, we're increasing our productivity. We're making more money, perhaps, or we are doing more good. But in the end, it's like, if you're in the metaverse, what are you going to be spending that imp increased money on? Your virtual trip to Hawaii <laughs> or your virtual couch that you're going to buy. So all the money is literally just going back to the company that's increasing your productivity. Everything is money-based. Yeah. Everything is, uh, is commodity-based. It's yeah. ridiculous. And it's also with like, okay, with Facebook, you're now increasing the amount of time that you can contact your friends and family. But it's like you're also taking away your time that you could be spending with them in person. Yeah. It's just such a messed this up cycle. This is why cycle. I think it's like, they're, it's like they're appealing to kids who don't remember before the pandemic. Yeah. They're like, oh, yeah, I really don't like that we can't see each other now. Mm -hmm. It's like, but this isn't a permanent state, yeah. for one thing. And also, I cynically think that Facebook deliberately unveiled it at the time when everyone is most sick of mm -hmm. lockdown and not being able to engage in anything for mm -hmm. realsies. I agree. Uh, the next pro was entertainment will just be better. And... The thing is, entertainment is fine how it is. <laughs> I argue it's not in a great state. I miss going to the movies and the arcades and the mall or like social gatherings. Yeah. And that's entertainment. Entertainment is playing cards until 4 a.m. and being like so tired you're going to like fall asleep but then eating a bunch of junk food. Like it's, there's entertainment is like a physical experience. Yeah. In my opinion. It's going to a gallery. It's not just looking at them all on your phone because as entertainment... I said, I said, if you're high all the time, you're always going to feel low <laughs> because I feel like that's how it is with entertainment now, let alone in the metaverse. Yeah, your poetry. It's like if you're always going to be like, oh, I went to this concert and then I went to the Louvre and then I went for a run in the Alps, depression is going to increase. Anything, right? Yeah. I have an issue with the way that they just, for a lot of people, a lot of companies, carelessly sling around the words entertainment and media and content and consume mm -hmm. as if all these things are just one big thing mm -hmm. like what you do it's like there's art and then there's socializing mm -hmm. and entertainment is often somewhere in between like playing mm -hmm. cards or something but when it comes to art in the video they show the example of movies it's like you'll mm -hmm. be completely surrounded by them and video games mm -hmm. you'll really feel like you're fighting that purple dragon mm -hmm. well this kind of goes back to my thing about like nerds i really don't mean to use that term disparagingly because i think Everyone is one today, <laughs> mm -hmm. including us, in that we lack so much meaning that we get excited about the thought of fighting a fake purple dragon, mm -hmm. which is which is rather sad. It's this fundamental misunderstanding of art in that it places all its value in how immersive it is. Mm -hmm. And so I, I actually don't think immersion is what makes art beautiful. I think it's almost mm -hmm. the opposite. What makes art beautiful and worthwhile is kind of its interplay between like this created world and the real one, mm -hmm. which is why I think music is best when it's played out loud. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can hear it with other people and you can hear it 
amongst the sounds of the world, which mm -hmm. is great. You can dance with other people, all these things. Books require effort. You, don't, you can't just slip into them. That's part of the great thing about it. Paintings, typically you had to go somewhere to see it and it would be curated mm -hmm. and deliberately shown in a certain order in a certain room mm -hmm. in a gallery. And most importantly, all these things end. Like mm -hmm. they don't just last forever. My favorite yeah. books, I love them, but mm -hmm. they're like 300 pages yep. or 500 or 1,000, whatever it is, they don't, it's not infinite. Mm -hmm. And this is, I think, one of the curious um, things about the shift between movies as a dominant form of storytelling and television shows. Mm -hmm. Like I said about the Avengers, it's as if people said, yeah, but that only lasts two hours. I want mm -hmm. to stay with these characters for three years, mm -hmm. five years. And I'm like, that's probably not a good thing, though. I feel it in myself, but it's like, that's probably not a good thing. Yeah. My biggest thing about art ending mm -hmm. is that what most people cherish about reading books and watching movies or what they remember is how you feel afterwards. Mm -hmm. Like when you finish a good book or a great movie, you walk out and you think, my life has changed. Yeah, you feel inspired. Hopefully, that's the kind of art that I like and that's what I think mm -hmm. makes art art. It inspires you in some way. Yeah, and I feel like that's kind of a trick that TikTok plays and the metaverse version of TikTok will play is you feel inspired kind of when you're like flipping through and you're like, oh, this cool business, this cool artist, blah, 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 as you like scroll and scroll. But then by the time you're done scrolling, you're too exhausted to use that inspiration to do anything to make the world a better place, let alone in the metaverse where the world is a perfect place in there. The world around us is just going to crumble because we're never going to come out of it with inspiration to then paint the walls, upkeep the parks, and so on and so on. Yeah, You mentioned about... The immense commodities as well. I don't remember, maybe in the productivity section you were talking about that. Mm -hmm. But I had this quote by um, a journalist and professor of film and media studies called Ian Bogost mm -hmm. about the metaverse. He said, it's this kind of capitalist monopolist fantasy about capturing all of your attention and every dollar that you spend inside of a world that parallels the material world. Mm -hmm. And it's like, that's true. It's, it parallels the material world and it treats us only as a consumer just like the real, just like the world today mm -hmm. and the internet today, but you don't even get the product. Yeah. Like you don't even get the plant pot, the shoes, mm -hmm. the laptop. You just get an imitation of one. And I was thinking, okay, we're still going to need food, but odds are in the metaverse, <laughs> because that's a lot of the demonstrations I've seen is the metaverse, Walmart or Superstore, what have you. It's like, okay, you're going to be walking around the virtual grocery store. Say you love grocery shopping like you and I do. So we'd obviously be going to the Metaverse grocery store, not just letting them pick it for us. I mean, I think those meal like... Uh, those meal kits are pretty meal popular. Meal kits are very popular, right? Yeah. So anyway, say we're, we're shopping for the sales and we get the sales and they get shipped to us. But we're going to be so like in this world. It's like there's this phenomena called like the wedding price phenomena. It's like when you're shopping for your wedding, it's like, oh, $1,000 for this? That sounds great. Because hmm. you're in like this world where everything's inflated. Yeah. And I suspect in the metaverse would be the exact same thing. You would just kind of lose sight of what a dollar is. Therefore, you'd probably be being scammed out of your money because, okay, you're like, oh, the bananas are $2? Excellent. But in reality, bananas are like a dollar. True. And so on with everything else. You also most likely won't have done any real work for, for mm -hmm. the money. Yeah. So commerce was another thing. was like, oh, it's going to be great for commerce. Everyone can be an artist now or what have you. But I just feel like, no, like it's just going to be forcing people to do stuff they don't want to do even more so than we are now. The materialism is just so ugly with it. Yeah. I remember maybe a year ago, we were thinking about Animal Crossing, the video mm -hmm. game series. And we were like, this is fun, but is it good for you? I know there's a lot of, um, a lot of studies that are like, this is good for stress relief and things like that. Mm -hmm. So it's a calming simulation. But then when we really thought about it, we were like, the whole game is just about decorating. Mm -hmm. The whole game is just about either building or buying things. Mm -hmm. In that way, it, it mimics a lot of the modern life. But the fact that this was such a selling point for the metaverse, it just mm -hmm. it made me feel really disgusted in the video. He was like, this is your home space. Decorate it however you want. And mm -hmm. it was like this thing we've been thinking also recently um, to ourselves about personality tests and why they're so popular today, mm -hmm. which is that people can help define themselves by which office character they are or their horoscope mm -hmm. or which aesthetic they are on TikTok. Yeah. And it's like, that's exactly what this is, which is um, one, it's not real aesthetics. 
Two, it's not real self-understanding. Mm-hmm. And three, it's all just sold to you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's just all, there's going to be no soul behind anything you buy in the metaverse. There's going to be no small business mom and pop shops. It's going to all be pretty big. And even if there's the indie artists or what have you, I feel like they're not going to feel fulfilled. I mean, like, it's not real art. Yeah. <laughs> That's one thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, the final argument for the metaverse was fitness. It's just what it said. And I just like, I literally just wrote underneath what? Because <laughs> it was like, imagine your boring crunch routine is now augmented to be done on a spaceship. And I was like, your crunch routine? Who's crunching with a VR set on? Like, you'd be playing Wii Fit, perhaps. Okay. I loved Wii Fit. Right. Big fan. But like, I didn't gain anything from that. Yeah. And it's like, okay, everyone doesn't have to have the body of Nadal or whatever. But it's also like, if you're sitting in here for eight plus hours a day, our bodies are important. Have you seen Wally? I don't know. It's just like, it's a negative feedback to mental health and physical health if you're sitting in there all day. Even if you're having all the dopamine in the world from all of these activities, your body is going to just like... No, this is why I think people need to be shamed. <laughs> I do think shaming is good. Like if someone, if someone said to you, like you met someone, you were hanging out and they were like, yeah, I spent 10 hours in the metaverse yesterday. You shouldn't just say, oh, okay, that's cool. Yeah. You should say, don't do that. Yeah. That's bad for you. Yeah. Just there's so many reasons, but like, okay, sell me all these things, whatever, but don't try and tell me that you can be more fit by being in the metaverse because it's just, it doesn't make any sense. Your yoga routine done in the metaverse is not going to be the same as the deep breaths on your mat. Well, they don't need it to be better than, than the deep breaths on your mat. They just want it to be better than the deep breaths on your Mac, Ooh. on your MacBook. Because one of, the, one, of the, <laughs> one of the scary defenses I've seen with the metaverse is it doesn't have to be better than real life. It only has to be better than the virtual world in which we already engage Ooh. and in which, as I said, Americans already spend over seven hours a day. Yeah, that's painful. In. Yeah. But like I say, we need to do less of that as well. We do. That's the thing with degrowth. I feel like it's our goal right now is growth. But it's like we don't even need to just stop growth. We need to degrow. And I feel like that's the same with the metaverse. Like we don't even need to just stop that. We need to decrease our internet usage as is. Yeah. Just one final thing. You were talking about the headset and exercise. And it's like the headsets, no doubt they look dorky and awful. And I'm sure they make you feel bad. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't really like using that as a main criticism of it. Just like I don't like a main criticism of it being Zuckerberg's character because mm -hmm. it's like these things, I just imagine them being as perfect as can be. Like imagine yeah. them just feeling like AirPods and contact lenses. Mm -hmm. It's still bad. Mm -hmm. It's still really bad for the other reasons. Yes. Speaking of AirPods and contact lenses, this week's episode is brought to you by the organism of the week. It's called the muskox. And I have an image for you. Actually, I actually have two. So the first one is of multiple and then the second one is just singular okay <gasps> they look like these really ancient sheep what are these they look like I'm trying to find the word like rams yeah but their their fleece looks really perfectly rounded <laughs> yeah and then one ah yes like a little mountain goat but yes it's really but long not, fur but not little really big yeah chunk are these guys still in existence? Yes, they are. Really? They look extinct. They look like <laughs> woolly mammoths, but a little smaller, perhaps. They're a very old organism. That's why I wanted yeah, to, to use like them because them. it contrasts with the everything new. Mm -hmm. Like Zuck. Mm -hmm. He's kind of like the evolution of the human species. Perhaps. You know, it's funny when people use that term. Oh, it's like he's people talk about like a super athlete and they're like, oh, they're like a, the evolution mm -hmm. of the species. It's like, I don't think the species is evolving in a positive way. Mm -hmm. I think Zuckerberg is a lot more like the future. Perhaps. Wow, that sounded really mean. Yeah, I but feel like I think you've said a lot of mean things about him. No, but I think he deserves it because I think he does all this stuff uh, willingly and because he wants to be some kind of technocratic dictator. Yeah. I don't think he deserves much respect. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, back to the muskox or Ovibos mosatus. It's native to the Arctic. That includes Greenland, Canada, shout out. Really? And Siberia. Mm -hmm. And it's noted for its thick coat. You noted that. Mm -hmm. And the strong odor emitted by males during mating season. You didn't note that. 
I didn't smell that. No. If you're in the metaverse, maybe you could have smelled that. Oh, <laughs> great. Um, this is one of the few species of megafauna to have survived the last extinction event and the last mm, ice age. I can tell. It looks ancient, right? That's why, yeah. I, that's why I like it. It looks like something you'd see in Lord of the Rings. Mm -hmm. It was around during the Pleistocene. Mm. That sounds like cool. it was a long time ago, right? Yeah. They grow to about four to five feet high, five to eight feet long, 400 to 900 pounds, <laughs> although there was one which I think was in captivity or in like a, a watched area mm -hmm. that grew to like 1,200. Oh my goodness. Yeah. And they have very thick coats. The wool is called kiviat, quiviat, and it's coveted for its softness and insulation. Wow. It's like a really, really expensive wool. I think it was mm -hmm. like 40 to $80 for a... Scheme. Sure. <laughs> They're herbivorous, which I thought was surprising because they look like units, absolute units. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, they mostly feed on willows, grasses, and lichens. I really want to meet one of these. And the only predators are the Arctic wolf. As I showed in that picture of multiple of them, they travel in herds of 12 to 24, depending on the season. Hmm. I really, like, I really want to see one of these in real life. They remind me of bison, right? Bison, well, bison that's the word. They were one of the other um, surviving megafauna from the Pleistocene. And I don't know, there's something about these, these types of animals. Maybe it's because they're so intimidating. Maybe it's because they just look so of a different time. Mm -hmm. Like, it's hard to believe that's around in the same time as VR helmets. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I love it. Yeah. That's a good transition to the positive notes because getting a little woozy from this metaverse conversation. So we both developed some SDGs, some Solocene degrowth goals, and they're kind of in addition to the existing SDGs. The SDGs right now, like, there's nothing wrong with them. Yeah. Reducing poverty, I'm not against that. That's the thing. I was going <laughs> to come up with my own set, but then I was like, well, I can't omit reducing poverty. Yeah. So it's like, it's an amendment. Yeah. Only one of mine critiques an existing goal. Ooh, okay. But the rest of them, we're just letting them stand. How many do you have? I have five. Okay, I only have three, so you can go first. Okay, so my first one is, well, it's kind of a duo, but my first one is knowledge of place. You know how they're all kind of phrased like that? I do know. Yes. Over the last 70 years, we have been disconnected with nature by 66%. <laughs> okay. And I was trying to find stats, and I found this interesting study done on words relating to nature in songs. For every one word that's related to nature now, there were three in the 50s. Wow. So that's how they measured it because they were like, how do you tell how people have like stopped to smell the roses? I do wonder if that's because of uh, religion as well going down, but you know it's, what I mean? Religious they, songs always use nature mm -hmm. allegories. They did do, they looked into the reasoning and I don't know how they found this, but their suspicion was that it would be religious or urbanization yeah. changes. But it was actually technological advances that they attributed to, like increased time indoors, increased time in cars, makes sense, et cetera. So knowledge of place, how I think we can achieve this is education of the history, plants, industry, culture, species of our places. So mainly through education, but that would also lend itself to knowing the food you're eating, knowing the people around you, and so on. Another stat that I had in relation to this SDG, is that kids can name more Pokemon than species. What? Yeah. Well, th when they say species, do they mean the Latin name? No. That's... Incredible. That should be like our, our podcast slogan. Yeah. So it seems. Because kids can name more Pokemon <laughs> than species. Yeah, it just said species. And I was like, so they can't even name like <laughs> dog, cat, carrot. <laughs> but it was like... When, I guess it must have been how they phrased the question, but still, it's like if you ask a kid to name some species, they should know some. Yeah, they should. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm going to go with my other one since it's kind of a duo. It's connection to place. So knowledge of place, knowing about the place, but like physically being connected. So as we're developing and changing and the world's evolving, we need to keep this in mind while we're making changes. And what I mean by that is increasing our dependence on our neighbor, basically. And it's like increased dependence doesn't sound like a good thing to be striving for, but I think we should be striving for interdependence and knowing our neighbors, having pride in our yeah. space and so even, on. I don't even think that we're especially 
much more independent than maybe the 1950s. Mm -hmm. But it's just that our dependence is on seamstress in Taiwan, farm in Alberta, mm -hmm. water from who knows, yeah. energy from there. Like it's not exactly that we're off the grid. Yeah. But we just want all the dependencies to be a little bit more local so we know who to thank. I mm -hmm. think that that's, that's a very practical reason for it. I like that as well. What's your first SDG? Well, firstly, I liked how your one and two, like knowledge of place and connection to place, that's a very UN type mm -hmm. separation. Yeah. Because in the goals, they have like life below water and then they have like clean life waters. on land. There's themes to it. Mm -hmm. So for mine, I also tried to kind of mimic their iconography, mm -hmm. but I went a step further because I tried to create the little the logos, icons. the little icons I like that. that they have for those, which let me. Um, just say, I think they failed at miserably because <laughs> I don't think any of theirs are especially memorable. No. But I think mine are, have much more personality. Okay. So my first SDG is an internet of virtue slash of merit. And I also tried to name them like they yes. would name them. So that's a little drawing. So it's a little eye. Internet. For internet with muscles, a heart, and yeah. feet. Those are the things. Yeah. Feet because like people are walking around, muscles because like people are strengthening themselves physically, emotionally, socially, spiritually, intellectually. Mm -hmm. Yes. And the heart, because imagine an internet where it's all kumbaya. I love that. I was trying to find stats on the absolute vitriol that, um, <laughs> Percent that, negativity. that, that, that permeates social media, mm -hmm. but I couldn't find any, except I could find they did a study and they found that negativity tends to get more traction and more retweets mm -hmm. than positivity. Yeah. And I was like, you needed to do a study for that? Mm. but they did one and it was proven mm -hmm. another couple stats i had were millennials i don't really know who that is no but millennials are estimated to take about twenty-five thousand selfies in their life wow i don't know if i believe that but let me put it like this i do believe that some people will take about twenty-five thousand selfies mm -hmm. in their life and i think some is too many and I think that people below us or younger than us, I use below because I think it's kind of like a hierarchy where we're at the top in terms of how good people are, <laughs> our generation that is. We um, need to, this isn't actually a comedy special, like people might think we're right. serious. No, but what I mean is we know how to take selfies, unlike the people older than us, mm, but I we see. don't take them, unlike the people younger uh, than us. I see. I feel like I believe that stat. I was thinking about it since you said it. People who Snapchat, like it's always selfies. Right. And they like send insane amounts. But of I do Snapchats. think, well, I mean, I don't really use social media, but my, my instinct is to say that selfies in the traditional sense are now a little bit outdated with the younger crowd because mm -hmm. they just take videos of themselves, which is like 60 selfies a second. It's true. I don't know the frame rate of TikTok videos, but something like that. The average tension span is less than eight seconds, officially mm -hmm. less than that of a goldfish. Okay. That's a real like boomer Facebook post. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I had this quote, which is, the internet has always been and will always be a magic box. Could be good, could be bad, mm -hmm. could be all the evils of the world come pouring out of it. Mm -hmm. So the points I want to talk about with this SDG are the place of the internet in society as a tool mm -hmm. or a means to an end and not the end itself. Mm -hmm. It should really supplement living, but mm -hmm. not replace living. Mm -hmm. uh, humans using it to strengthen, not weaken ourselves especially in conjunction with education and kids, because like I said about the way we externalize our brains. Mm -hmm. So now, for instance, we don't know how to do math because we have calculators mm -hmm. and we don't really remember much because we know we can just Google it later. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's a good thing. I agree. And also somehow using the internet to, which sounds like oxymoronic, but somehow using the internet to localize culture and remove celebrity culture because mm -hmm. I don't think that's a good thing. And, and minimizing vanity, because that's a large part of the selfies. It's just people trying to use selfies to climb the social ladder and uh, what's it called? Clout? Get clout. Mm -hmm. Excellent. My next one is safeguard future generations. What I mean by that is we need to shift our orientation to be long-term oriented. I wanted to introduce the concept of Hofstede's cultural dimensions. Do you know what those are? No. So Hofstede was this psychologist or whatever 
and he is that was that his official title psychologist. i i always say psychologist but he could have been something more specific okay but he was a social psychologist i'd say and he created these dimensions to measure a culture long-term versus short-term orientation is one of them but i wanted to use this framework to say how we can safeguard future generations by building the ideal culture and obviously it will vary it will always vary so i chose two cultures that i respect and thought i'd share them to show how much of a difference there is before kind of going through my ideal where i'd want to live so the first one is power distance so power distance is do we feel empowered that we can be a leader or do right. we just respect the fact that there is a hierarchy and we have to submit to it so canada has a low power distance a rate of 39 out of 100 so that means we accept a little bit of inequality. We accept the fact that there will be leaders and there will be followers. But Japan has a 54 on the power distance. So they're a bit more reverent to people in power, a bit less likely to question it. And in my ideal, I said that we would have a 20 power distance. Yeah. So very low. It's like we would be questioning everything. Democracy. Democracy would be very flat. Very it's egalitarian. Egalitarian, that's the word. And there would still be people in power. There has to be people who are like leaders because it's like we can't all be the mayor. We can't all be coordinating. Um, but I think that would help us safeguard future generations instead of just this is how things are. You have to fall in line. It's like we encourage people to question things. The next one is individualism. In Canada, it is 80. That means we have a very loose-knit society. We are all individual. We do not really care about our neighbor. Very big country. That's why. Yes, I agree. And Japan has a 46 which is one of the highest out of the Eastern countries. Yep. Um, a lot of them are even more collectivist. But a collectivist society, I think, is very good. When people are in need, we take care of them. So I also gave that a 20 in the ideal world. Masculinity is one, which is not positive or negative. It's just 100% masculine would be 100% very like competitive, really striving, and then 100% feminine would be just super caring, like loosey-goosey, just like <laughs> we love everybody. I don't even know. You're going to get canceled for that one. <laughs> <laughs> but I feel like 100% feminine society wouldn't work and neither would 100% masculine one. Okay. We need a balance of the yin and the yang. Well, they would ha they had to reproduce. It's true. Wouldn't last very long. <laughs> but Canada is right in the middle. So they're doing pretty good. There's like a balance of caring and striving. I sense that. Yeah. Uh, Japan has a 95 masculinity. So they're... What? Yeah. I did not think that would be the case. But what that means is they're very like... Because it's a bit of a dog-eat-dog -dog world, you mean? Yeah. Just oh. like get things done. Um, don't be too emotional. And I think the ideal would be 50. Like I think we need both. And yeah. I think we need to shift a little bit more towards the feminine. Because we need a little bit more caring, a little bit less... Let's just get stuff done, heads down, don't feel. A little bit more. Um, uncertainty avoidance is one. So that means if you have a low uncertainty avoidance, like Canada has a 48, so like they're kind of in the middle again. It's like you're open to new ideas. But if you have a high, like Japan, who has 92, very traditional. Conservative like, versus conservative. liberal, basically. Yeah. Okay. So I said the ideal world would be about a 30. And I am like pro-conservation in some cases like i don't think we should just let the metaverse in we need to be critical thinkers yes, yes but i think we also should be a lot more open towards change than we kind of are in areas other than technology and like social order and such let me put it like this when it, if you try and put it on a scale of one to a hundred in terms of what should be considered mm -hmm. i think it should be very well low means really open so i think it should be very low because i mm -hmm. don't think anything should be too sacred that it can't be yes. uh, rationally appraised in terms mm -hmm. of this might have been good 100 years ago, but is it good today? Whatever mm -hmm. systems, climate change shows this. Mm -hmm. But in terms of should the things change, mm -hmm. I think it should be about 50-50. You mm -hmm. know, it's, it's a case by case. Yeah, exactly. Uh, there's two more. So one is long-term orientation. Canada is very short-term oriented. We are very just like, what's the best we can do to get through this week sort of thing. Japan is very high, 88 percent they see their lives as a short moment in history which i liked the phrasing of that of just like we're a blip 
yeah. don't take yourself too seriously. Like you might have to sacrifice for future generations. And I said the ideal world would be very, very long-term oriented, 90%. There's obviously cases where it's like, okay, we need to treat someone in a hospital and sacrifice the long-term plan, perhaps. Yeah. And like there will be things that come up. But I think overall, you need to think long-term. I'm going to sound like a real weeaboo here, but I think it might be because in Japan, there's a lot more like uh, of a family culture. Yeah. You know, respect towards your grandparents. Whereas... um. Here we don't really interact very much with people outside mm -hmm. of our age range, either yeah. much younger or much older, mm -hmm. for the most part. I agree. So we tend to only think about our lifespan mm -hmm. and not our place in the family tree mm -hmm. or what will come next. Mm -hmm. And the final one, which I think is a, an addition from when I studied this, because I studied it a few years ago. So obviously Hofstede himself, I don't think, added this. I don't know if he's still with us. But maybe he added this, or maybe his institution added this, but indulgence is now one. Okay. Maybe it was always one. But Canada has a 68% indulgence rate. So, like, we tend to indulge in pastimes. We tend to indulge in junk food and so on, which is, I think, goes hand in hand with long term versus short term orientation. Yes. Yeah. And Japan has 42% indulgence. I said the ideal world would be 15%. I think it's nice. Like, I think... <laughs> Get that candy out of here. That's what but you said. I, I don't think indulgence is the right word for, like, what it means, perhaps. Because I think, yeah, everything should be beautiful in the ideal world. We should all be able to eat whatever we want, basically. But I don't think it should be so separate from the normal functionings of life. It shouldn't be on the weekend I indulge, on the weekdays I work. Yeah. I think it should just be, like, everything is lovely. <laughs> obviously right which would make the quote-unquote indulgences much healthier yes like we're we're both pretty staunchly anti-alcohol and anti-drug in general but we mm -hmm. were considering in the last week the alcohol culture in a lot of european countries compared to in north america and we were like mm -hmm. well it seems like it's a lot healthier mm -hmm. because it's more present like that doesn't mm -hmm. make a lot of sense but it's because it's not just relegated to the weekends where because everything else is so kind of stiff-lipped i think that's mm -hmm. the word we have to get really drunk Mm -hmm. it's kind of like that right yeah it's just like you have a little bit of a a little bit of a buzz yeah whatever. not advocating that but no but, but that's that's the difference and i feel like that'd be the indulgence in the elder world it'd be like oh every day i get to go for a walk so i don't have to indulge in this like four hour stroll on the weekend which i don't think that's a bad yeah. thing but it's like it wouldn't be just this one moment <laughs> i it would don't know be... who's doing that but yes yes okay <laughs> there's the mustard's podcast and jenny mustard on youtube they always talk about like their Sundays, they just like walk. And that's where I got that inspiration. Okay, the next one is anti-corruption. And I have a little logo for it you can explain. It's a crest with a microphone, a money, a flag, and a test perhaps in the four corners of the crest. It's a shield, like we have to defend ah. these four things. So we have a microphone, we have a dollar bill, mm. so we have free speech and economics. Mm -hmm. We have a ballot, elections, yeah. and we have a flag, which is something like, well, not really in the, um, in the nationalistic sense. Mm -hmm. It's not really about the flag. Mm -hmm. It's about values. Mm -hmm. Because I had this quote, the corruption of every government begins nearly always with that of its principles. I was like, yeah, that's, that, seems, mm -hmm. that seems right. And some of the three major causes for corruption that I found that have been studied well, greed is one, but that's obvious. But the other three were political and market monopolies. Mm -hmm. So basically, when there's not a lot of competition, companies and parties can do what they want. Mm -hmm. And you see that in, for instance, America. Mm -hmm. where it's like, oh, there's only two parties, so they, they can, can really do, what they do what they want. They can really do what they want, yeah. <laughs> um, bureaucracy and inefficient administration. Mm -hmm. One of the most frustrating things in the modern world, I would say. Yeah. And... Low media freedom, which I think was an interesting way of saying the distance between the media and the government on which it reports, I, I suppose. Mm -hmm. So some of the kind of uh, points of action I had for anti-corruption were local democracies and more stringent anti-lobbying regulations, mm -hmm. better ways for citizens to hold politicians accountable. This mm -hmm. is something that I actually think technology doesn't do enough of. There should be more apps where we can track politicians, mm -hmm. see... Um, how they hold up to their promises, see what's happening right now in 
government, mm -hmm. all these kind of things. See yeah. where spending is going. Like, why isn't there just an app for that? Mm -hmm. Why isn't there an app where you can input all your purchases? Actually, maybe that's not a good idea, but you can search products mm -hmm. and it will tell you where the tax for each product goes kind mm. of thing. That's an interesting idea. Corporate transparency is another one because it's not just what governments do, but also some corporations are so big that they're more powerful than many governments. So mm -hmm. I think we should, um, we should be able to see what's going on with them as well. Mm -hmm. And especially the transparency with regards to their relationship to governments, which should be minimal when it comes to policy making. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and also education with regard to politics. Education is kind of like a key point. You can just say that for everything, but yeah, especially about how corruption is the enemy of democracy because a lot of kids and a lot of adults come out of school not realizing that oh, the reason my vote isn't doing anything, the reason it seems like nothing changes is because of corruption. Mm -hmm. It's not just incompetency. Yeah, it's not just the people who are elected are just, oh, well, they just failed. Yeah. It's like, no, they're literally being paid <laughs> to fail. Yeah. My next one is economic degrowth and decent, meaningful work. So this is my only critique because there is one SDG, which is called Economic Growth and Decent Meaningful Work. And I think over the pandemic, like almost 300 million people have lost their jobs. I think people should work. As you said, the meaning of life is basically like meaningful work. Meaningful work. I so, think so I think I'm not saying, oh, these people shouldn't get their jobs back. They should just be given the money to live. They should just be like a UBI. I don't think UBI is like fully bad, but it's like I'm not saying that's the solution. And use that to degrow. So I think these people should be employed, but doing things that are artisanal, that are local, that are empowering. And I think our steps in rebuilding for the pandemic shouldn't be striving for GDP growth. It should be striving for community growth and empowerment of the individuals to do things that they care about. So imagine if you got fired from your job doing like accounting, which you really didn't like. Mm. And it's like, oh, great, I get my job back as an accountant. Or it's like, here's a subsidy and you can do whatever you want with it. Get a new degree. Right. You can start a business. You can use it to invest in a local business, to partner with them or what have you. Or even like with the accountancy example, I think something we miss about work, we just watched Mary Poppins last night, right? And she said yes, that you can just find the fun in anything, like cleaning yes. a room. Like accountancy, most people won't enjoy that. Most people mm -hmm. aren't going to enjoy crunching the numbers. Yeah. But everything around the actual task can be made so much more enjoyable that the crunching the numbers is just a small part of the day. So for instance, maybe you don't like sitting in an office crunching numbers for a corporation you don't care about and that doesn't care about you. Mm -hmm. But if your local bakery was like, I need some help, mm -hmm. you would love to do that. Yeah, of course. You get some free croissants. Mm -hmm. They're going to be nice to you. You form a legitimate relationship. Yeah. And you feel much more useful. Yeah. So if we were trying to go with the traditional SDG of economic growth to try and grow things, it's like the most efficient use of putting these people back in jobs would be putting them into the jobs for the biggest corporations so that they can grow and the GDP will grow. Yeah. But maybe, okay, they're going to go work for this bakery which is like super inefficient by like the traditional standards like they take they put love into each loaf <laughs> and they only make three loaves a day but it's wonderful the people who get those loaves cherish them and yeah. it's just it's building building life life yeah and <laughs> so that's my only amendment to the normal sdgs that's a good amendment yeah my final one that uh corresponds with that really nicely and it's the world as art or beauty mm -hmm. as a guide. And I had an image here which might actually be a little bit more confusing than I thought it was. Ooh. So it's a globe? Yes. With paintbrushes. Oh, they are paintbrushes. Okay. Yeah. Good. I was worried you'd think they'd be matches. <laughs> Burn it down! <laughs> <laughs> because I'm, I always see this image of like a landscape or the planet with a paintbrush. Mm -hmm. Oh, you can make it. But I was thinking about that I was like, it'd be nicer if there were many paintbrushes because really the world, Steve Jobs has this quote, it's like the world is just hundreds, thousands, millions of people in history making something. Mm -hmm. And then that's what we all walk around in today. Mm -hmm. like that's all it is. So my quote for this was, 
the working at beauty in the world is the first step towards purifying the mind. Mm -hmm. And a statistic I found for it in America was that, I think it was two years ago, the National Civic Art Society asked 1,000 or 2,000 people, which of these two buildings would you prefer for a federal building? And it was like a very kind of run-of-the-mill classical design for a building, mm -hmm. columns, etc., and a very run-of-the-mill modern mm -hmm. glass office type building. And 72% said that they would prefer the classical style. Mm -hmm. And that was the case for across the board with no change by sex or race or class mm -hmm. or age. I mean, architecture is just one example, but mm -hmm. I'm saying that there are things that everyone prefers that we never see. Mm -hmm. And that's purely for financial reasons, but it's yeah. like sometimes you have to put beauty first. Yeah. And um, it's kind of sad that so many of the world's great buildings were only able to be built because they were financed by people for whom money was no object. Mm -hmm. Whereas today we kind of look down on like really rich people just building a castle for themselves. Mm -hmm. We're like, oh, how dare they? Yeah. But 300 years later, we love castles. We do love you know, castles. That's really great. So my kind of actionable points for this were to protect the purity of aesthetics. I was talking to you a while ago about this really nice church that we were seeing in Montreal, but it was closed and it had graffiti on it. And there was like an ugly telephone wire stretching across the front of it. Mm -hmm. And I was like, why can't they just leave something to look nice? Mm -hmm. Because we said, it's not even about how you grade the aesthetics. Like I think this old church looks really nice, but there is a power grid um, a short while away from our apartment Mm -hmm. and we're like, oh, that looks, I don't think it looks very nice, but I do think it looks pure because there isn't a tree right in the middle of it. It's just mm -hmm. like a, a single aesthetic, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, and we're not saying all the government buildings have to be the traditional, like, columns. No, 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 no. But it's like, if you get Banksy on it or get someone on it, Banksy. I, I don't know any modern artist I'm just saying that sometimes him. it would be nice if a government <laughs> building, no less, reflected what the people actually wanted. That'd be wonderful, yeah. And individualized cultures in the name of like, how come everywhere looks exactly the same now in terms mm -hmm. of new buildings? I don't really like that. Yeah. Laws regarding advertisement, that's an easy one. Human design that accentuates nature rather than pollutes it, corrupts it, tries to drill right through it. Yeah. That's one thing. Nice sounds and smells because those are often neglected. Mm -hmm. And more artistic exhibitions. So for instance, not just seeing paintings on Instagram and not just hearing music through headphones. I like the idea of open door art galleries in a mm -hmm. building or, you know, charging admission. I just think it's much nicer when, as I mentioned with the metaverse, they're contextualized in the real world. Mm -hmm. You're viewing them with other people. An example of that I had was in Nova Scotia. We went a couple times to see a production by a group called Shakespeare by the Sea. Mm -hmm. Right in the summer, they do like open air Shakespeare productions. Mm -hmm. Those are really fun. They were really fun. Those were really great. And it wasn't pretentious mm -hmm. and it wasn't expensive. Yeah, it was just pay what you can. Yeah. Come um, sit outside and watch some Shakespeare. Or like a poet on the street. Yeah. How come we never see those? I know. I remember when we were walking around England, there was like this town that we were just like, we get, I feel like we we're always just getting stranded in places. So we were yeah, like, yeah. we were just like stranded in this town for a few hours and we were like, let's just walk around. But then we like happened upon a theater. We went to see a performance of Great Expectations. We happened on like two art exhibits, or at least I think there were two. Yeah. And one of them was like, you just walked in and we we're like, is this like a thing? And they were like, yeah, just come in. And you don't have to pay. You don't have to do anything. <laughs> it's like you don't just stumble upon things when you're on the internet. You have to search them for the most part when it comes like in this context. It's a good point that I'm saying these things should exist, but in the main, they already do to some extent, but yeah. we just don't see beyond our screen. So we don't actually mm -hmm. stumble into them. That, that is a good point. Yeah. Stumbling into places. Wonderful. Stumbling. I yeah. mean, that's, that's really the, the most concise repudiation of the metaverse is that it doesn't allow for stumbling. And I'm not even joking. Yeah. There's no stumbling in it, except the, the sad image of the person stumbling over their couch in, the, in their living room with the helmet on their face. Smashing into the wall. <laughs> yeah. My final SDG was well-being and mental health. There isn't an SDG about mental health. There's one obviously about physical health, which I think is great. We need to decrease... Asthma would be wonderful. Yeah. Decrease gluten-free sensitivities because <laughs> I, I can't anymore. I need a, need a cure. But mental health, I think, needs to be a priority as we begin to degrow. So we need to 
encourage collaboration on these goals. <laughs> I feel like I'm at the UN, but so that mental health is safeguarded and those of us who have suffered from mental illness and not been able to find treatment as we rebuild society, build in options for treatment. So investing in training of psychologists and psychiatrists, making it accessible and trying to build a society that prevents mental illness. Yeah, that's something that it, it annoys me when people talk about mental health. They never actually talk about stopping, you know, turning off the tap. It's only yeah. about getting the water out the off the floor. Yeah. It's like, why don't we consider why this is happening? Mm -hmm. Metaverse. Yeah. It's metaverse, Mark. So I said, okay, treat those who need to be treated, but also just invest from kids from a young age to limiting screen time, encouraging the learning of coping mechanisms. I cried like 10 times while watching Come On, Come On because it was about this boy whose mom was like teaching him how to cope with life, basically. And he was like then teaching it to his uncle who had never learned these things. And I was like, this is so pure and wonderful and just what we need more of, teaching kids how to, oh, this is a garbage situation. But instead of just like bottling up the emotions or acting out to like cope with it and work through it themselves or with another person, those are my SDGs. It's really a battle for the souls of children. Yeah, that's what it all is. Between the forces of good and the forces of evil. I mean, that sounds dramatic deliberately, but that's that's how I view it. Yes. <laughs> um, okay, thanks for listening. We've been rambling for a while now. Hope that you stayed till the end. If you did, we have a little treat for you. Um, Bazinga. <laughs>